It was fifth floor, King Edward Memorial Hospital. I'd been there two days now. My oxygen saturation had dropped in the 80s. I required supplemental oxygen on my face. My heart rate was moving at about 120. My kidneys showed a creatinine that moved from 1.2 to 1.9. My GFR was decreasing. I felt like I had razor blades, glass bottle, and sandpaper in my lungs. Not sure of what will come next. A Dr. Benjamin was encouraging he needs to go to the ICU. I couldn't defend myself. I was helpless. A gentleman named Kennedy from Kenya said, Dr. James, uh, you need a more intensive care. But we can't get you into the ICU. There's a resistance. Looking at the numbers, now two weeks since you last saw me, standing here as your moderator, speaking on your Logos channel. My absence created questions for you and concerns reasonably so. But I had to hide my private situation to protect my profession and my reputation. So my absence was in neglect or denial. It was survival and self-preservation. The second week that I wasn't here, it became concerning. And of course, I received the call. I said, I, I can't come in. I'm, I'm busy. And by the third weekend, it was clear that I had to tell, I have COVID. I'm in the hospital. And Michael Scott was called. I said, Michael, this doesn't look good. They're resisting me in the ICU. And the Caribbean doctors from Jamaica, Trinidad, Barbados were fighting. A, to get me in, and I knew that no continuous oxygen monitoring, no telemetry, with no understanding of how I was doing, sudden death could come from an arrhythmia or a, a continued decline. Michael, sing me an obituary, please. I need you to sing a song because I'm about to write my obituary. You see, I've been haunted by God a long time. I first confronted as a little boy. My sister would tell you it was a time when the elders had to be called to lay hands. Something is wrong with this boy. He's... But I'd continue journeying through life, living a life of duplicity, because in our cultural context, to share your spiritual strivings as a male, you feel like it's weak. In other words, to be publicly Christian means almost to be publicly crucified. For deep spirituality is for those who cannot handle matters on their own. In other words, if you're faithful to your calling, that means you're unfaithful to the male culture. So we're quietly hiding out, whispering prayers, but never outwardly living the life practically. I'd go on to college, still with my quiet strivings. Though I was hiding, it was very clear to others that God had chosen. And, and so while I was initially confronted, it would be when Elder Brooks came and he preached right here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church and talked about the last day's message. 
that the world is moving very quickly toward the end of time because we are already in the time of the end. The time of the end started in 1844 when the sanctuary in heaven began to be cleansed. In other words, God is making up his number. There is a book called the Book of Life. And everyone who says they are a Christian or a believer, their name is there. There is another book of records that they're looking at your record, if your name is in the Book of Life, to see should they rub it out. Or should it remain? That Jesus right now, since 1844, is in the business of cleansing the sanctuary of records that are negative, records that have things that you don't even want to tell your worst enemy or your best friend. There are places that you've been, things you've done, people you've been with, and thoughts that you have that need to be cleansed. Because there is an executive judgment coming where your record will be looked at and you will have to stand with your record, your reputation, your recklessness and face the music yourself. Elder Brooks preached that and I said, wow, that seems like I need to make a decision. So not only was I convicted and convinced, yes, convinced, when I was called by God and then convicted when I was challenged by prophecy. But you know, God still has to do more to get your attention. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And it would be that I go on to college. I don't know how I actually put it in my mouth and in my mind that a little boy from Lighthouse Hill St. David's sitting on number 22, I think it was 20, what was it, Lisa, 22? She got, she's got a better memory than me, my sister Lisa. 22 Mount Hill, and, and I used to have dreams about being a doctor, and my sisters were my nurses, and we were gonna take care of the community. Uh, you know, that was the way it went, and of course, our home was a sanctuary. But how are you going, to, when you get to really trying to get it done, now, that costs money. And, uh, you know, when I was a boy, when you wanted to do things like medicine, you had to apply for the Sir Henry Tucker Scholarship and the Banker Butterfield Bursary. And, you know, that was out of our league. You know, it was for people that wasn't like me. I, I, not only was I weren't that bright. So I thought, and I wasn't rich. And there was another criteria that I don't have, which I still don't have, and I won't have until Jesus comes, and I hope he doesn't take this criteria from me because I don't want that criteria to qualify. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. If you're in my social location, my circumstance, and from my background, if the sun has kissed you a little too long, there's some things that are just, you know, Lane stays, 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 stays. There's some things just, you know, you just outside of your reach. Broke, black, and also bullheaded, you don't qualify. But somehow or the other, not only did God convince me and convict me, you know, he actually confused me because he got me into medical school. I said, how did you do that? Still not converted. Laying there, writing that obituary, and listening to Michael sing that song. Somehow or the other, the ladies down there at the King Edward got me into ICU. And there was a Jamaican, a, a CT tech, can't forget him, was working right here, stopped everybody, said, man of God on board, hold up, must pray. Now, <laughs> They're trying to see, does he have COVID lung? Does he have pneumonia? Does he have pulmonary embolus? Does he have a ruptured bleb? We're trying to save him. He's on oxygen supplementation, six, six liters of oxygen, heart running at 122. And this man is paddling everybody, stop! Man on God on board, must pray. Preacher! And he began to pray. Sometimes you need those type of people around. 
You don't need a city ditty, highfalutin, deep prayer that goes into the third spot. No, you need somebody that just calls it right there in that situation. I couldn't help myself and my wits were escaping me. I, 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 so glad I see you, brother. And of course, that put me up on first chapter, on first, on fifth floor, couldn't breathe. Fighting again, the ICU. Not sure why I can't get in it, but have my own suspicions. Whether it's true or not, I shouldn't have the burden of wrestling with those complexities, but we live in a culture and a context where being black may be a risk factor for your survival. And whether that played into it or not, that was part of the crisis. Meanwhile, Logos is wondering, where is the moderator? I'm just 10, 15 minutes away surviving, trying to keep my life alive. And then Jasmine Cain shipped me out of Bermuda. Nevin made sure that it happened. Landed in Broward County in Florida alone. After two weeks laying at 22 Fork Lane, Southampton, downstairs, my nephew brought me food until I wasn't eating anymore. Mom said, You're gonna, he needs to go. Now in Broward County, in that hospital alone, Reviewing my life when God confronted me as a boy. Looking back there when God convicted me. And now looking at medical school and he confused me. He got me through and the university owed me money. <laughs> and I'm still black. So you know that will confuse anybody. Black and broken, they go, you, Loma Linda owes you money? Don't tell them, don't tell them, don't tell them. They may take the degree. But confused, still confused. But laying on that bed, I entered into a process of conversion. Because I couldn't help myself. I think you also know of your own experiences where you've been convinced, convicted, confused, but sometimes God has to cut things down to build them up. Wild tales running here and there. What's wrong with him? I'm not, I'm not, and then you got that pressure coming in. Of course, on high dose steroids, out of my natural mind, confused medication, IV nutrition. And then this man, Dr. Redner, down there in Broward County, a pulmonologist, said, Dr. James? I said, yes. While you're still on six liters of oxygen and you've been out in the field for two weeks and, well, they've given you azithromycin, they've given you prednisone, high dose I see here. Someone even chose vancomycin. They thought you might have had spontaneous bacterial endocarditis. And I see you've also had, uh, uh, you've even had resdesmavir. Not much more we can do, but I, I'm doing research on a product and it's not very expensive and I'm going to give you some. Totally said, man, whatever you got. Just as, <laughs> but, but I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going through conversion, so no dope, no, no, no morphine. I mean, just come straight. Because there was a lady that came to me, man, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. Okay, right. God is good. <laughs> I needed that right then, church. Yeah, God, real good, because he done got me this job. I said, who are you? I'm the cleaner. I'm cleaning. I'm, I'm cleaning. I'm cleaning. On a, on a normal day, I can go through. I, I'm good. I'm real good, but not right now, sweetheart. Not right now. Just, well, let me tell you how good God is, because, you know, I got the job. And I'm going to tell you, don't tell nobody, but you had to get your urine tested. I said, okay, okay, where's this going? Because, I mean, I'm just trying to get better. <laughs> well, I use somebody else's urine. <laughs> but God is good because I still got the job. 
I said, you know, you're right. You're right. I don't want to get into it, right? But mom, are you finished? <laughs> she said, a doctor or nursing in. Gave me ivermectin. Six hours later, I was off the, op, uh, the oxygen supplementation. Six hours later, I was out there for two weeks, out there struggling and suffering. Heart rate 120, like I mentioned, a post uh, uh, oxygen saturation going down and just totally wasting away. Got a medication, I don't know who he was, where it came from, but it was the right one. Harvard couldn't take me, no room in the end. Uh, Johns Hopkins was full too, and there was no planes going to New York. Wound up in Broward County, a strange place, but there God began to do something for me. I think in your life there's been times when you've been through the similar thing. And we look at our culture today. You know, God has confronted us coming out of oppression and bad situations and dark storms and deep stories. I've been to many countries and I've seen people who were confronted by the very presence of God. When I was in Brazil, took my nephew and my mom there, we could see how the iron chain of Portuguese slavery had oppressed these people, but God had broken it and given some type of relief. You know, I was actually seeing not only where people are convinced, uh, con con confronted, but I saw the sign of liberation when Mr. Bogle down there in uh, Moran Bay was actually leading a rebellion of people all the way to Kingston in Jamaica. They were, I was sure that people were convicted by that. And you know, when I travel even to mainland Africa and I see what God is doing there in different places, God is confusing people because despite the fact that you've been, things have been taken away from you, people are still in survival. Somebody ought to say amen. And I don't have to go that far to see this. You can see it in your own house. Uh, some of you know what an outside toilet is. Some of you don't. Some people know what it means to pump water. Some people don't. Uh, some people know what, what the porn smells like. Now, the porn didn't stink to me. It was just normal in the morning. <laughs> Lived on Parsons Road and... Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> but God has moved in our situation. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. And we ought to be knowing that we are confused. How do we get here right now? Some people got hot water and cold water, running showers, and you never had a shower before. You was out there in that metal tub. You know what I'm talking about. You know, get in there with that Life Boy soap and stuff. You know, don't play dumb now. You got Maytag now before you had on the washing board, that one with the wood on the side and the slats of glass in them. You know what I'm talking about. But God has moved in our situation. Hasn't he moved from being confronted? And haven't he moved us from being convicted? And many of us are confused because you're in your right mind right now. Put your hands together and give God some praise. But still when I look at what's happening and Cat Williams announced what's taking place in America, we are still not converted. A moral depravity and degradation and spiritual decay that's spreading around the priesthood of survivors. The people who God has brought a mighty long way have turned their back on the moral principles of the Bible and you should not be afraid to call right right and wrong wrong. The scripture is talking, not you. But I want to show you in the scripture there's a message about second wind. You know, a guy was telling me he was running this race and he's a Bermudian, ran 24 for me. Mr. Ming said, Dr. James, I was running, and, and, and I was coming, coming down Burnt House Hill. I said, okay, Ming, got you, I know you are. Yeah, and I, I had a good thing going, man. And then Ray came past me. Ray who? Ray Swan. I said, okay, this takes me back. And, 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 and I, I, I knew I couldn't get him. My body just seemed like it fell out. My legs cramped up, and it seemed like my tongue got thick like cotton, and my heart was beating very hard. The sun seemed extra hot that 24th of May, and my sweat was running down my brow. I, I'm not sure what happened, but all of a sudden, a lady, I could see her coming toward me, and I was about to faint, and something came over me. My legs came back. My breath came back. My mind came back, and all the runners that left me, some or the other, I got a second win. 
I, I saw short people and small people. I don't know how did they get past me, but I started moving now, coming down past flagpole. I had that second wind. Came up the hill, coming up there by Queen Street. Came down the road, coming up Marketplace. I know where I'm going. I've got the second wind, and I could see Ray behind me. Coming up to National Stadium, I don't know where this thing came from. It was a second win. He was better at the end than he was at the beginning. You know, sometimes God has to take things out to give you back so you can have your second win. I, I want to talk about a protection person in the scripture. Uh, and, and, and the text is really a fascinating one. It's after all this a world that we're going through right now, what we see in America between the Democrats and the Republicans, what we see in Bermuda with jail and sickness and suffering, uh, when it's all happening right now, something else is happening in heaven. While the world is going down, God is making up his number. Uh, now, just because you come to church don't mean you're in that number. Y'all ain't listening to me. Y'all ain't listening to me. Because Babylon is not just people in the world doing immorality. Babylon is people who are faking it to make it. Oh, y'all not listening to me. Y'all not listening to me. Babylon is more a spiritual problem than a secular one. When we talk about the world, that's more Egypt and Sodom. But when we talk about Babylon, it's really church that's gone bad. And those people who are called believers, who are living a lifestyle that is contrary to the will of God, are Babylon. But the scripture says, and I saw this, another angel come down from where? With what? Now, when the Bible speaks great authority, you need to look. Because great authority is not just regular authority, it's authority over everything else. If you think council culture has authority, I know somebody that's got great authority. If you think people that have been pushing you around has got authority, there's somebody that's got even greater authority. And the text says, and the earth grew what? Bright with his splendor. He gave what? A mighty shout, what's that's happening right now? That's not an angel that's going to come. The angel is shouting right now. This is present truth. The text says, Babylon is what? Fallen. That great city is bad. Fallen. Come on now. She has become a home for demons. She is what? A hideout for every what? Foul spirit. A what? Hideout for what? Every vile vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. That's talking about spiritual people, religious people, political people, or a nation that came on the scene in Earth's history as a religious nation. It was a lamb-like beast. It looked like the lamb, but spoke like the dragon. That is Babylon, which is fallen. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. The passage goes on further. Now, the text is the context. Go back to the book of Jeremiah. God wants to talk to this man named Nebuchadnezzar. What's his name? Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I like Nebuchadnezzar because God loves Nebuchadnezzar. You know, just because they're your enemy doesn't mean God hates them. Y'all ain't listen to me. No, I ain't talking to her, but God's talking to her. You have caught off somebody that God is actually using. Do you know the person at your job who you don't like? God actually puts them there because he wants to use them to perfect something inside of you. Oh, you're not listening to me. No, no, listen to me. Sometimes God brings people to work with you who you don't want to work with because he's not trying to get it out of them. He's trying to get something. Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about. Out of you. I'm going to keep going because I'm going to get stuck. Right? I'm going to get stuck. Nebuchadnezzar of where? Babylon. That's an ancient city. It was a big city. I like Babylon because it had a lot of technology. Not only did it have technology, but it was a wealthy city. Every brick in the city was layered with gold. But Nebuchadnezzar had a little bit of a problem. Had a little bit of self in there. Just a little bit of little, little, something, little self. So every brick, he said, oh, that looks nice. I wonder if I could you know, just put my name on the brick. 
Okay, which brick? All of them. <laughs> so every brick in Babylon, I want every brick to have my name on it. So we've got a problem. Because I think there are some presidents who have been like that. They're very fragile people. You can't really you know, say your opinion because they may cut you down. And if the truth be told, there's a Nebuchadnezzar in me. The inability sometimes to see past my blind spots or my historical filters. And I've been a Babylon. I've been a Nebuchadnezzar. The passage goes on further. It says, but God calls Nebuchadnezzar what? His servant. Just because you hate Nebuchadnezzar doesn't mean that God hates Nebuchadnezzar. God is still working through your enemy. And, you know, sometimes God wants you to be the tool to win the enemy. You know, not listening to me. We spend so much time hating people, but the reason why God put them in your life is so that you can show a little love to them. But they like this. But they like, have you seen you? God has got to do a lot to just work with you. And sometimes it is loving your enemy that perfects your character. And so God loves Nebuchadnezzar. And God even said, I have put everything, come on now, even the wild animals under his control. Application. When I traveled to Bugamaya there in Tanzania, I saw where the Germans had ravaged Bugamaya. Then I had seen where the English had gone and taken them out. My mom and I went to Fort Jesus in Mombasa, and we saw the Portuguese had raped and pillaged. And sometimes it does get me angry. But that is local Babylon. Down at the end of the ten toes of Europe, Western Europe, is the new kingdom, the new empire, the new Babylon. And everywhere I go, whether it be Brazil, there's Portugal. When I was in Kenya, I saw the British. When I was there in Cuba, I saw the evidence of the Spanish. The ten toes of Western Europe, the local Babylon. Now, it doesn't make sense hating because it doesn't make you stronger. We've got to find another solution to this problem. The passage goes on further. He even put the wild animals underneath his feet. The text says, the king went in and conquered these people. Now Daniel was sitting there, sort of like the people that I saw when I was in Kenya, in Ghana. I was at the Al Al what is it? The castle, yeah, Al Camino Castle, where there's a gate of no return. So I was there and I was scratching my head because on the right hand side, there was a place where male slaves went. And there was a pit that was very deep. That deep pit was full of human excrement, where hundreds of strong men who came all the way down from northern Ghana, out from Nigeria, Mali, were brought down to this slave trade, bathed, put shea bottle on them, and then put on an auction sale. That was Daniel's situation. Babylon had marched into Judah and had conquered, raped, and pillaged. And Daniel was taken miles by force to serve in Babylon. Now this makes you uncomfortable, but this is what makes you uncomfortable, is the fact that you don't understand what's making you uncomfortable. Application. You're not aware of the contemporary Babylon and the forces that are working against your culture and your identity. As a result, you're uncomfortable when we talk about it. But if the Bible on weekends don't talk about the newspaper on weekdays, it's a total waste of time. The passage goes on further and says, the king assigned to people like Daniel a daily amount of food and wine for the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Now, you know, three years in training. I didn't do the regiment. My nephew did. I just did a couple weeks and did the band. And so all y'all who I was training at BI, I, I was faking it. <laughs> I was in the band. The marching, the climbing up, the, a little bit of that, Cherry, Cherry Park. Right? That, that, no, I wasn't shooting and all that, no. But Daniel had to go through three years. But Daniel's king, Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant, had something in mind. I don't only want to change your name, and they did that. I don't only want to change your diet, they did that. I want to change your worship allegiance. That Babylon is really used by Satan to force you to worship Satan by worshiping false idols. 
And, and so the text says, one of the things they did, they said, these people were to be trained for three years and then they would enter the king's service. But the text says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and what? The food that was used was offered to idols, so foods that could actually lower your base passions and make you susceptible to suggestion. What am I saying? You can get possessed by demons by eating certain food and drinking certain wine. Because your mind is not clear and the food you're eating will access your base sexual passions, you enter into sexual activities that were used by temple rites so that you can worship Marduk, the God, and be overcome by demons application. Some of what you're seeing on the big screen today is nothing but demonic warfare. You know, let me make it more clear. Some people are actually involved with temple rituals that are designed to lower your passions and have you be overcome by demonic forces and that's why many people are out of their right mind. Babylon has given us food and wine to control and confuse because the ultimate aim is to get you to worship Satan. But because the European Western culture said, religion's not real, only thing that exists is science. And since we're in charge, we get to tell you to stop talking about the Bible. There's only science. And so while you're shame, yeah, well, yeah, I ain't really gonna say my grace because I don't wanna offend nobody. Uh, yeah, I, I, what you doing on Saturday? Oh, I'm, um, Resting. I saw you on TV, wearing me. Yeah, you had a black suit on, never me. That we've learned to avoid being authentic about who we are because Babylon has us in council culture. In the process, they've got you where they want you. You're confused and you're beginning to bow to Marduk and Baal. But Daniel said, listen. I'm not going to go so far with this. You know, you do have to draw a line in the sand. Now, the king is watching because this is a story about how God is trying to get the attention of Nebuchadnezzar. So the first thing God does is he actually does something. He says, I'm going to get three Hebrew boys that are actually going to just blow their mind. So guess what happens? Daniel says, I'm not doing it. And do you know that when Daniel said no, God said yes? When Daniel said, I'm stepping out on faith, verse 9, Daniel 1 said, then God gave him favor. You didn't hear me. Daniel stepped out on faith, and God gave him favor. If I have more time, I'll tell you there's a lot of favor in the atmosphere that people don't access because they haven't stepped out on you're expecting God to give you favor before you step out on faith. If you're living a life of disobedience, compromising yourself, you're not getting any favor. God's not looking for chickens. He's looking for people who are willing to be used by him who say, I'm stepping out in faith. And there's one blood washed saint here today. Put your hands together. Hasn't God shown you favor? If you've seen favor when you stepped out on faith. If you see favor when you step, just let the world know, I've got favor. You know you're walking in favor right now. You ain't supposed to be driving the car that you're driving. Some of you are supposed to be dead from a disease. Somebody's marriage is supposed to be busted up. Somebody's supposed to be out of their natural mind. But because you said no, God said yes. And when you stepped out on faith, God gave you favor. But it really wasn't just for Daniel. The passage says, God gave these four men unusual aptitude, understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. You know, when God does it, he does it right. I said, when God does it, he does it right. You don't got to be the brightest bulb on the tree. You just got to be available to be lit up by God. The passage says, and God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. And he's given us those books. We actually have the secrets of Daniel that we can interpret what's happening. Cat Williams ain't telling me nothing that's not in Revelation 13, 14, 15, and 16. And because Dr. Tall and I, every morning, are one hour in the book of Revelation for the past two and a half to three years every morning, I've been able to see things that I never saw before. You're not going to get it if you don't go get it. So it's not about sitting in the pew. 
It's about Christ sitting inside of you. Oh, man, I'm getting, okay, okay, okay. I'm making up for a lot of years that I should have been doing this, so you can get a lot of stuff in a short time. The passage says, when the trained people ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as who? Read it with me. Daniel, who else? Hananiah, who else? Mishael, who else? Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Verse 20, what did it say? Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them what? Ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Some of you have had that experience at your workplace. You don't know how you knew the answer, but somehow or the hour, the, the boss asked, and everyone's supposed to be brighter than you, they didn't have the answer. Little old you, little dummy, little St. David's Island of Mohawk, back of Tom Pondog, you know what I'm talking about, had the answer, but it wasn't you. Because God has chosen to work with you. He takes the simple, oh, y'all ain't listening, to convince the wise. The passage goes on further, ten times greater. So now the king is convinced. There's the living God. But it doesn't stop there. Convinced is not enough. Some of you have been convinced, but not converted. You have been in church a lot of times. You got your little prayer meetings all the time. You're convinced. You listen on the radio. Whisper your prayer. You're not converted. Passage goes on further. So this king in chapter 2 shows up with a dream. And in the dream, he doesn't know what it was that he saw. And this is a king that's a little fragile. This is the guy who puts his name on everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, if he was running today for one of the parties in America, he might fit one of the character types. I'm not getting into it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going into it. <laughs> but, you know... You got to be careful with some kings, right? They get defensive, they get insecure, they get sent. They start firing generals, they start firing people. They just let you go. So such is the case. When he couldn't figure out the dream, the king said, get me somebody who's not going to interpret it, but somebody's going to tell me what I dreamed. But the passage says, when Ariok, the, come on, read it with me, the commander of the king's guard had gone out to put to death the wise man of Babylon. Did you see what it says? Put to death. In other words, his going right off his rocker. But God is working Amen. with Nebuchadnezzar because that's God's servant. The passage says, I like what it says, and he asked the king's officer, why is the king issuing such a harsh decree? And then he explained to Daniel, at this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. I'm so glad that Daniel was kind enough to say, you know, let, let me talk to my God. You know, some of the problems you have at your workplace, it's okay to take some time out and say, even if they don't believers, you're there for a reason. The pastor goes in front. The king asks Daniel, called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Don't just come with an interpretation, because I'll take your head off too. But you've got to tell me what I dreamed. Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain the king's mystery. Uh, but there is a God in heaven, come on somebody, who reveals mystery. Y'all ain't listening to me. He who has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. And I want to just parenthetically add, Nebuchadnezzar was not just talking about what happened back then. Nebuchadnezzar saw a dream of what's happening today. Yes. Nebuchadnezzar's dream talked about what Cat Williams let out and got 50,000 views for. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar understood the crisis that we're having in our country. He needed someone to interpret it. God never has a dream without an interpreter. There are never problems without God giving the solution. Do you know today there's a remnant church of prophecy that actually has the answers in the books of Daniel and Revelation and given special insight and wisdom to interpret the times that we're living in? Uh, do you know those people? You ought to find one of those people, one of those churches who actually can explain what's going on. Now, you don't want people who are faking it to make it. You want people who really understand it. Stay with me, church, and who stand under it. So Daniel is looking at the king. He says, I can get that information. King says to Daniel, after Daniel said, your head is gold. That's you. 
Bronze, that's me to Persia. Waste, that's, that's Greece. Legs, Rome. But there's going to come another group of people. They're the people that are in Bugamaya, in, 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 in Tanzania. They're the people who are in Kenya that cut off the hands of the Mau Mau. They're the people who took and chopped up the hands off the people, King Leopold. These people are going to be the ten toes of Western Europe. They're going to be the last empire. But that wasn't the focus of the dream. After that, there's going to be another king. A king of kings. A lord of lords. Who's going to set the captives free. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar heard that prophecy. He was not just convinced. He was what? Convicted. Some of you have been convicted by a Daniel Revelation prophecy. Some of you have been convinced because God has done many things for you. And I like what Nebuchadnezzar says. The king said, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. Yes. King Nebuchadnezzar was being spoken to by God. Yes. Is it possible that your boss, the people that you hate, the people that don't look like you, are actually people that God is convicting and converting? Would it be interesting that if 10 years from now, or 3 years from now, or 2 years from now, this place doesn't look like this place? God does not have favorites. But he does give favor to those who step out on faith. I don't care what color you are, what you look like, where you went from, God is looking for his bride to make up a number. Because there's a judgment in heaven, and there's a book that needs to be figured out because soon the books will be closed and sealed and you cannot get your name in the book and you cannot expunge the negative off your record. So he's convincing and he's convicting because ultimately he wants to convert. Now Nebuchadnezzar, just like me, didn't fully get it. He went on pretty good. He said, you know what? You said the hair was gold? Yes. Uh. That represents me. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar. Right. I'm just thinking, what if I made the hill statue go? Here's a Bermudian. Got to be. Local, 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 local. I'm um, ace boy, little mom. You know, you, you know, you, I don't know how you're going to take this because, like, sometimes people can't receive stuff because they got blind spots and filters. What you trying to say? I ain't saying nothing, Nebuchadnezzar. Make it fully go. And everybody come out and worship it. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody came and worshiped it. But you know, just because a law is going to be put into place, you don't have to render unto Caesar that which is God's. You render unto God which is God's and render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But when it comes to a point of worship, you've got to tell Nebuchadnezzar and his Get Fresh crew, get out of town, I'm not listening to you. Well, I like what the three Hebrew boys said. Listen, I'm not careful in this matter. I'm not calling you majesty. I'm not calling you king. I'm calling you Nebi. Yo, Nebi. Nebi. Listen, everybody. Hey, listen, I'm telling you, I ain't gonna do that. Who's that? Hey, we guys, you know what I'm saying? We guys from Israel, man. We ain't gonna do it like that. Hold up, hold up, hold up. This sounds like a strike or a riot. Hello, you guys. Didn't I give you like an uplift in chapter one? Yeah. You didn't want to eat the food, and, and you guys showed up better. And in chapter two, I, I bumped you up, right? Yeah. Look, man, work with me, man. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of people's looking. CNN's her, CBC's her, even Travel's out here. What we got her? <laughs> TNN's got me on blast. Hey, man, just not look, you know, give me a look. You know, I ain't trying to get you in the knee. I, I know you don't like the pork. You ain't got any pork. But hey, you got a ball. We ain't balling, Nabby. He said, I'm turning it up seven times hotter. He said, seven times hotter, my God works in extreme temperatures. Took him up, dropped him down. The people that dropped him got burnt up. The three Hebrew boys had on pantyhoods. I don't know why they got on these pantyhoods, but that's something they had in the Bible. I saw that. And it ain't what you think. Stay with me. Had a hat, had a coat, and, and 
The only thing that got burnt off was the ropes that held them. Do you know that the things that people are trying to use to hurt you will be liberated from you and the ones who are trying to destroy you will be destroyed by the fire that they set up for you? I've seen it in my own life. And you're walking around like in an air-conditioned, cool place in a furnace that's seven times hotter. Application. Your job, they put you downstairs there to do the mail when you should have been a vice president. Only to discover you found a million dollar sweepstake check in. Y'all ain't listening to me. What well, I'm saying to you, listen, listen, listen. You ought to go where God sends you. Because when you step out on faith, God gives you favor. And now Nebuchadnezzar is all messed up. Because he said, um, looky here. Um, I'm looking in this fire. And I see four people. And one looks like the son of God. Because Daniel had walked with such integrity and character, the three Hebrew boys had walked with exemplary behavior, Daniel's character showed what the king of God looks like. And because of that, the king, he said, I see what these guys are aiming toward because that fourth guy, he looks perfect. When he came out, blew his mind confused. Sometimes God has to convict you. Sometimes he has to confront you. Sometimes he has to confuse you. He's still trying to convert you. Application. The king said, Daniel, truly your God is the greatest of gods, the Lord over kings, a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this secret. But next to that, their king has to look at something else. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement. Read it with me. And what? Exclaimed to his advisors. What? Didn't we tie up how many men? Three men and throw them into the furnace. Come on, everybody. What? Yes. Your majesty. We certainly did. They replied, look. Nebuchadnezzar shouted. I see how many men? Four men unbound walking around the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of God. Kevin, my friend who's here in charge of get security, when he was in the United States, he called me. It was a crisis. And at that time, I knew I had limited options and resources. But there was a fourth man. And though I was here, a fourth man was there, interceded and solved the problem. Kevin is here with me today, and he understands exactly what I'm talking about. A fourth man showed up in a fire where I couldn't be there. Daniel wasn't there. The three Hebrew boys were in the fire, but there was somebody else in the midst of the fire application. You may be going through something right now, and the pastor can't be there, and your friends can't be there. You may be on a bed in Grower County in Florida, but there's a fourth man in the fire, and his name is Jesus. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar now convicted and convinced, now confronted by the very living God. He says, what? Read it with me. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, what? Praise be to the God of who? Shadrach. Who else? Meshach. Who else? Abednego. Who what? Sent this angel and rescued his servant. They trusted in him and what? Defied the king's command. Look, say that. Go back, go back, go back, go back. Go back. They what? Trusted in him and defied the king's demands. Sometimes it's right to do civil disobedience. And you're going to have to get used to that, knowing when to stand. It's when it deals with worship. They trusted him and defied, and defied the king's commands. And finally, what? And were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any except God except their own. You know, we've given up our bodies to people who ain't even as strong as Nebuchadnezzar. You've been in relationships with people who've threatened you with fiery furnaces. I'm going to abandon you. I'm not going to marry you. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to fire you. We're going to curse you. We're going to, curse, we're going to starve you. But if you're standing on principle and step out on faith, God stands on power. Amen. And it gives you his favor. Amen. Even Nebuchadnezzar is confronted, but not converted. God loves Nebuchadnezzar. Finally, chapter 4, and we're going to close out here. We have a king who God is working with. And, you know, God has been working with somebody in this room today. You know at some point in time in your life it was confronted. You've been convicted. You've been con also been convinced. 
but you're not converted. Because it's not going to be beating you down that's going to convert you. Condemning somebody that shows up on social media in an inappropriate way is not going to save them. It just talking bad about people like, and, and making it a part of your social is not going to save nobody. Just because she's a horrible person, uh, she's still God's child. Censoring without also cultivating is only going to cripple, it's not going to cure. Now, the, kicking people out of church without working with them and walking them back is not going to fix it. So God sometimes, when you're getting old and it seems like it's too late, he has to step into your situation in order to turn it around. There's somebody right here today is going to go into this next passage because when I got sick and I went into the ambulance and I called a friend, he said, you're about to go into something that when you come out of it, you're not going to be the same. You haven't seen me. I was Nebuchadnezzar. Convinced, convicted, confused. Nebuchadnezzar one day stood up. And Nebuchadnezzar now with his name on every brick. Nebuchadnezzar with gold all around. He said, look at the country I'm building. He doesn't have an outside toilet. Nebuchadnezzar is not pumping water. Nebuchadnezzar doesn't use Life Boy soap. I remember we didn't have a telephone. We used to go and ask Mrs. Burchell or, or, or the O'Connors to use their phone. And when we got a phone, we just looked at it. <laughs> because nobody knew our number. <laughs> Lisa likes the phone too much. We just looked. And then, you know, we practice our voice on the fan. You know, this is the James's residence. You know, this is an exciting thing. But now we're going past fan, cell fan, uh, and, and chat GPT, my best friend. The world is moving so fast, we forget where we came from. Nebuchadnezzar stands up there. This is the vision he said. This king says, while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> that tree that stood there, its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. And in the vision I saw while lying on the bed, I looked and there before me was a holy one. In other words, there's somebody looking down on me. And the text says that it, it was a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a what? In a what? In a what? We heard that before in Revelation chapter 18. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its what? And what? Scatter its fruit. Let the what? Animals flee from under it, and the birds be from its branches. Now, he went and asked his astrologers. They couldn't solve the problem. He asked the magicians. They had no answers. He went to Dr. Falsi, and Dr. Falsi came up with a lab leak theory, and he couldn't get that worked out. In other words, science of the day could not solve his problems. Application. The world of science has its place. I'm a scientist. But it cannot deal with the issues of morality and spirituality. The Western world, because of the abuse of papal power, Christianity through Constantinople powers, the Western world said, I'm done with religion. They may have been done with false religion, but my God is still living. And they threw away religion and took on science and made science the new religion. And because we live under the Western empire, we've given up our religion because they had a bad experience and taking on their new religion of science, and now we're having a bad experience. Because we are trying to solve spiritual problems with scientific solutions. And because of cancel culture, as an intellectual, you're not supposed to speak this way. The academy would not embrace you. You may lose your license. Take my license, but don't take my liberty. And because we don't understand what's going on, our boys are changing their lifestyles and our girls are changing their lifestyles, not because many of them were born that way, but because they've been socially confused and conditioned to make decisions contrary to the laws of God because it's predicated upon false science. I have a moral obligation to speak to these issues. 
I have a responsibility to talk about these things. And this is not an issue of should you treat people a certain way. Everybody needs to be respected. But the secularism and the exploitation of real issues to make it under the cloak of what the devil wants to do must be spoken about. And so sometimes things have to be cut down. Daniel came and said, listen, king, you are that tree. You have become a great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reached the sky, and your dominion extends distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down what? The tree. And do what? Destroy. But leave the stump bound with iron and brass. In the grass of the field, while its roots remain in the ground, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the wild animals until seven times passes for him. Sometimes God has to wipe you out to give you a second wind. But God put a brand, a, a, something of iron. That represents justice. He could have left it there back in the days then when you have an animal that's a wild animal, you tie it up with an iron attachment. It's a beast. But when you have a pet that you care about, you tie it with bronze. It's something you're trying to keep and cure. I like what happens here. Uh, he comes with bronze uh, like the trumpets. It's a redemptive call. But he also has iron like the plagues. It's a time of judgment, application. God put something around him so that when things fell apart, somebody was still keeping him together. You see, it wasn't just being confronted. That's not going to convert you. Yes, you can see big things in your life. Somebody had seen a miracle in their life. Somebody had gotten off of a substance. Somebody had a baby. Uh, God confronted you. So, wow. You were also convicted. You got baptized, gave your life to Christ. Some people are also confused. God just blew your mind. But it's when God cuts you down and not to hurt you, but so that he can hold you. Yes. It's the grace of God. You, Condemning people do not, does not cure people. We point them to the law, but then we point them to his grace. Amen. They're convicted by the law, but they're converted by his grace. Y'all ain't listening to me. I said, you, you, you're convicted by right and wrong. Don't let nobody tell you right and wrong. Don't, don't, don't go down that road. Really. It's wrong. But the problem is when we can't fix it, we decide, to let's get rid of the Lord. No. Then you turn to the Lord and say, I can't change myself. I need somebody to change me. Can I trust you? You see, Nebuchadnezzar's root issue is, if I do a psychodynamic formulation, he has issues with trust. His father was Nebuchadnezzar. His father was a very powerful guy, right? And, and so, so Nebuchadnezzar is traumatized because he's got a job he's insecure he cannot do. And many times strong, overt people are really insecure, introvert people who are put in a situation they're just trying to cope and survive. And that's why God loves Nebuchadnezzar. Because though you look at his heads and his habits, God understands his heart. And though he doesn't want to have to cut you down, he wants to confront you, he wants to convict you, he wants to confuse you, but sometimes it's only when he comforts you that you're converted. Somebody here knows what I'm talking about. You don't want to come back to church, you don't be confronted and convicted, you, you need to be comforted. When things have fallen apart, and they are about to fall apart pretty soon, I wouldn't take this responsibility on, I'm, I wouldn't do this if I didn't see something coming. Friends, there is something coming that we cannot manage. Science, we don't have the answers. But the word of God still has the answers. Somebody say amen. And then Daniel was able to answer it for Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know Daniel can still answer for you and me? But don't let God have to wipe you out so that he can pick you up. Because if you look along the way, God has been showing you grace along the way. The passage goes on. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. That's God. And he cut you down the tree to destroy, but leave the stump with bronze and iron. The passage goes on. The command to leave the stump of tree with roots means that your kingdom will be restored when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Application. 
You know God really wants to restore you? Amen. If you've messed up and really messed up, do you know that God still has a bronze around you? Yes. You know you ain't supposed to be driving the car you're driving. God's got bronze around you. You know you ain't supposed to be clothed in the clothes that you got. God has bronze around you. You know that he's kept your reputation relatively intact despite some of the stuff you've done. God still has his bronze around you. And I want you to not take that for granted uh, because only when you realize his grace are you going to trust his grip. He said, is this not the great Babylon that I've built? Despite this sermon, somebody's going to leave here still not converted. God will have to cut some people down because the judgment is about to finish. Now listen to your company. Read the scripture. The judgment is about to finish. And we're here on an assignment to warn the world but also to warm the world. I said to warn the world, but also to warm the world with the love of God. But if you haven't been cut down yourself, you probably can't build somebody up. And you're not safe in that space until God has you in his grip of grace. The same hour, the same what? The hour of judgment was fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a wild cow, and he was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was long, his, his eagle's feathers, his nails were like bird's claws. If you keep ignoring the knock, if you keep ignoring the knock of being confronted and con being convicted and being confused, you might have to be cut down so that he can comfort you because he doesn't really want to cut you off. Eventually, after some air, out in the wide air, and good nutrition, eating plant-based nutrition, <laughs> he had sunlight, sun, you know, said sunlight, sun, 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 sun vitamin D. Um, he had water, uh, um, and, 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 and he also had temperance. He didn't eat too much. He was out there, right? And he had pet therapy. There were birds and stuff. Came. It sounds like he had the Adventist New Start diet. Nutrition, come on, somebody. Exercise, water, sunlight, trust in divine power, air, rest, and temperance. You know, we are here at this time for a reason, church. God wants to use you to save a Nebuchadnezzar, and we've got everything that they need. And after this time had passed, I and Nebuchadnezzar looked up to heaven. Come on, somebody, read it with me. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High. Come on, read it with me. And honored the one who lives forever. Read it with me. He rules this everlasting, and his kingdom eternal. Come on, loud, loud, loud. What, what, what? All the people of the earth as nothing compared to him. Come on now. He does as he what? Pleases among who? Angels of heaven. Come on now. And among the people of the earth. Read it aloud. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? When God wipes out coronavirus by sending an Omicron virus that shuts down the whole plan, you have to ask, what do you mean by these things? When God decides it's time to set his people free, and people wonder, how did y'all get emancipated? There was a God. Do you know in the battle of the Civil, Civil War that the angels of God were interceding? When God is ready to liberate his people, nobody can shut it down. I love what Nebuchadnezzar read it with. He says, when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and kingdom. Somebody wants their honor back. Some woman wants her glory back. Some man wants his kingdom back. Come on now. My advisors and nobles sought me out. And I was what? Restored as my head of my kingdom. And even greater honor than... Put your hands together. You see what God wants to do for you? He wants to get you better than you were before. The passage goes on and says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven all his acts are just and true and he's able to humble the proud he is now what converted put your hands together and give god some praise well 
Well, friends, I came home, and it would take all of this time. for God to give me a second wind. Second wind. Not perfect, but in position. Not perfect, but in position. And I'm so glad that I have people who care. Because while he was in trouble, there was somebody taking care of his kingdom. It was Daniel. Do you know God has Daniels in my life that while things were not quite the best, they were there. My company is still there. My health is back. The family that loves me still love me. And the church members who I can trust, I can still trust. And so today, God has installed me to be your assistant pastor because I had a Daniel. A young man who came into the room with a 22 cowboy's jacket on. I didn't know that he, I would call him into ministry 30 years ago, and he's going to call me into ministry 30 years later. Oh, y'all ain't listening. Y'all ain't listening. I, I, I didn't know that when I was knocked out, God would set me up uh, uh, so that he can use me more effectively. And so I've come back imperfect, just in position, trying to do what he says because something is coming soon. And I'm convinced that it's not going to be by being simply convinced about what God has done. That's intellectual. Convicted, that's emotional. Or even confused, that's psychological. But only when you're converted will it change. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. There's somebody out here today that needs to go through that experience. I love this passage. God saves you by, read it with me, his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward. Come on, read it. For the good things you have done so none of us can boast about it. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Isn't it amazing that a man that killed people, a man that was out of his mind, that God was working with him. Don't cut anybody out or write anybody off. You may be the person that God wants to extend grace to them. With all that's happening in America with the black male confusion, it is not condemnation that's going to convert. It's still calling them to morality, God's moral law, because there is a judgment, but the way of change is grace, not guilt. Don't you see... How wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you. Doesn't this mean something as you're considering other people? Look at your life. Before you start talking about people, look at you. Your hair by by the hair of your chinny chin chin. If I half I might blow your house in. A second wind. So God, if he's got grace for you, the pastor says, Can't you see that his kindness, his what? Kindness is intended to turn you from sin. Finally, right now in earth's history, there's a message that's going out. The three angels' message has been pretty clear. Judgment is fallen. In 1844, he started a closing work. And do you know that the first angel told the gospel is gone? And the second angel said, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Babylon of false religion, that includes pagan worship. Babylon of science, morality is gone. The vaccine whole debacle showed you something. Science is good, but it is not God. Babylon has fallen. But there's a fourth angel that's coming on the scene right now. It's an angel that comes down from heaven right now with great what? authority and the earth will grow bright with his splendor and that message is the message of grace and that's the message of the seventh day adventist church there's somebody here today heads bowed and eyes closed god restores this was long yes 
But I have to contextualize and explain some things because I'm coming to work not as a spectacle or to be observed. I have to create a context in which there could be trust. And theologically, I have to explain my framework so that you're clear that what's going to work in Bermuda is grace. Your pastor and I have been working. He cares a lot about you. He prays about you. He has a tender young family. That's one of the main reasons why I've decided to return, to assist him. I want him to be able to be effective with his family. I said again, I want him to be effective with his family. I looked out for him back then. And while he's a watcher looking over me, I'm a watcher looking, come on somebody, looking over him. We want to make sure that Bermuda, not just Hamilton Church, Bermuda is better. Because they know that there is a God, there is a law, but there is grace. But this judgment is about to finish, and we must send warning while we warm. God and our Father, we come today. There's somebody here today that saw themselves here today. God restores. If you saw yourself in the past, just raise your hand. I saw myself. And you say, you know, I, 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 I don't know if I'm going to make it tomorrow. So I just want to say the sinner's prayer today and make my calling and election. I want my name to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I ain't got it all together, but I need my name to be there. Because if the judgment is about to close and my name is not there, I'm in deep trouble. If that's you standing on your feet, I want my name written on that book. I, I, I got to get it there. I, I, I don't know what it takes, but I need help getting it there. And there's someone else that's standing in before me today said, Dr. James, I want a second wind. If you want a second wind, you need to step out from the crowd because not average people get second wind. They're special people. They want you come out from the crowd and join me down the front. I want a second wind today. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Now you're going to have to break free from your pride, people's opinion, the public. I wouldn't do this. I would not do this. But a second wind feels good. I want the Bible workers to have cards. We just want to register the call and the response. We got strong young men here. Something is happening in Hamilton. And if we get it right, it will spread around the country. You don't have to be perfect, but you've got to be in position. Don't come unless you're convicted, convinced, and want to be converted. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Bible instructors, please stand on the cards. I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we realize that there is a spiritual world, that there is a God in heaven, but we're scared. We are very scared. We are fragile, we're insecure, we've been hurt. Somebody's been abused, somebody's been church hurt. Somebody's been family hurt. Somebody's been pastor hurt. Somebody's been daddy neglected. Somebody's been mama overwhelmed. Somebody's been abandoned by the society. Somebody was forced to do something that they didn't want to do and they haven't gotten over that. And there's something coming on the scenes of our history. And if we're not prepared with a second wind, we're not going to be able to run the race. But I'm so glad that you're in heaven writing down right now. I said, you're in heaven writing more names in the Lamb's Book of Life right now. Somebody ought to put their hands together right now. That somebody just got transferred into the Lamb's Book of Life today. That before this, you thought it was being convicted, being com confronted. But now you feel that God actually has placed your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Jesus' job is to keep it there. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. I said, Jesus' job is to keep it there. He just requires two things. Trust him and obey his laws. Thank you for the choices today. Forgive us for the length. But Lord, we're not apologizing for the work of the Holy Spirit. Forgive this person who's come today for not being the nicest person. Forgive me for injuring and being insensitive at times. My blind spots, my filters have prevented me from being effective. 
And today I come myself again, rekindling the second wind. There's someone else here today, Lord, that's filling out a form and they say, I want a second wind. I want, I want a second wind. I want to finish my race strong. I want to finish my race strong. If there's an angel going around dropping stuff, right, I want to get the favor, so I've stepped out on faith. And I want to thank you for the peace that we feel because we sense your presence. We know that soon you're going to close the book, but today somebody can rest if they die tonight assured that Jesus has their case. Forgive us for our mistakes. Thank you for what you've done here today. Thank you for Pastor Tall. Thank you for Pastor Manders, a spiritual leader who is seeing fit to prepare us for eternity. I want to thank you for Colonel Birch, who's here today, a friend of mine, who came because he supports. I want to thank you for Michael Scott, a friend who came because he supports. I want to thank you for the others who stepped out and, and, and saw fit to support us today, my family and other families. We're going to get through, not by ourselves, but together. Thank you, Lord, for my second win and a second chance for those who have come. We put this in your hands. We put this in your hands. These names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, and if they trust you, they will not be taken out. Put your hands together and give God some praise. Amen, amen, amen. Hug your neighbor, hug your neighbor, hug your neighbor. Pastor Tall.